So hello everyone and welcome to the OEI, OEI um, webinar chapter eight entitled the new YAML based OEI 5GC configuration, demonstration and design decisions. Um, this webinar is presented by Stefan Spettel, uh, Fantech CEO and uh, OEI engineer. So regarding questions, uh, Stefan will answer them at the end of the presentation during the Q&A time. And uh, thank you. I'm thanking all of you for joining the webinar. And I'm leaving now the floor to Stefan. Thank you. Uh, Camille, just one thing, please mute uh, everybody. Please, uh, please uh, those who uh, hear this message, please mute yourselves. And, uh, you know, if not, uh, Camille, you can uh, mute everybody here for me. Yes, and I will stop the screen share. All right. Uh, thank you, Camille, for that nice introduction. And I'm really happy that so many people turned up today. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Okay, so I would say let's start. So as Camille said, I'm an OEI engineer and I've been contributing since more than a year. And I've also done a lot in this new YAML configuration, which is why I'm presenting that today. So yeah, welcome. Um, we will talk today about the YAML configuration and especially about the design decisions, why we did what we did. And I will also make a demonstration of the new configuration. So the outline for today is first, again, I will talk about the motivation. Then I will go in detail about the design decisions. Then we will have a walkthrough together uh, with the configuration, through the configuration. And then I will show you three scenarios with the OAI core network, a simple one, the basic one, slicing scenario, and also uplink classifier scenario. And then I will talk about reducing duplicated code in the OAI 5GC, because this really um, plays along with this new YAML configuration. And if we have time, uh, we can go through some code examples, although I'm not sure I would rather reserve more time for the Q&A. All right, so let's start with our motivation. Why did we did that? Why did we do that? Um, so many of you who use the old or the current actually uh, core network will see that there are some issues. So currently there is three different approaches with the old configuration. You could have a bare metal, uh, deployment, so you need to take the SMF or AMF config file, put it to your setup and apply it for your specific setup. Then when you use Docker Compose, you have the environment variables where you can configure the core network. Or what also some people are doing is they mount a configuration file using Docker Compose. Uh, Docker Compose. And actually, uh, we think that most people are using the default Docker Compose setup to launch the 5GC. And what we've seen here is that the environment variables, they do not have a real relation to the configuration. So there is no structure. It's just a list of uh, names and values. Uh, and we have an entry point script. So people and users have to rely on this kind of auto magic of the entry point script. What do I mean by that? Just a quick example. So on the left is a, a part of a Docker Compose of an SMF configuration. So, you know, we want to configure a DNN OAI uh, video session type IPv4, or this is the IP address rate range, and so on. And on the right, we have the configuration part. So this is actually inside the network function in the container or on your bare metal deployment. So you can see it's not that easy. So because with our entry point script, we used to map these values. For example, the DNN goes here, and the DNN range goes here. And then we have the session management subscription config, which goes there. Uh, and that's exactly the problem because this context is missing. So people who want to change configuration and want to really understand what's going on, they anyway have to look at the config file. Um, and also with these environment variables, it's just difficult to have lists, for example, and we use this hack, as you can see here, we do the uh, zero, zero, and then the next one would be one and so on, right? But the Docker Compose file gets conf confusingly long. So these are the issues we have seen here. And from a user perspective, uh, also what we see with the configuration right now is that they are missing or ill-defined default values. Um, so when you just forget a configuration, uh, Sometimes it just throws an error. Sometimes it just takes any value. And also the error messages are kind of confusing. If you put a wrong configuration, sometimes it's just parse error. 
and it doesn't say okay where exactly maybe the line uh, if we are lucky uh, but we do have default values for the docker compose and this is handled via this auto magic of the entry point and we use a python and a python script using the ginger based syntax to add all these values to the config and it's not really user friendly and at some point we have decided okay we have so much logic in the entry point it should be done by the network function natively because that's the point of the configuration. And for developers, so from our perspective, we've seen that each network function uses a similar or even the same configuration. So therefore, each network function has code to parse and read the same values, which means overall our repositories, we have a lot of duplicated code. And the code inside the network function is also duplicated and also not always well structured. Um, also, there is a missing validation of user input, which is a user uh, problem because there is unexpected errors, but it's also a security problem for the uh, open air interface. And this is more an opinion, but libconfig, the one we use this kind of old school from the syntax. So the idea is to have one config to rule them all. And what do I mean by that? Basically, we use YAML as configuration language because YAML is de facto standard in configurations. It's many people use YAML. It's just very clear. It's very user friendly and human readable also. And we decided to use one configuration file to configure all open air interface network functions. So either can be SMF, AMF, NRF, PCF, you use the same file for the whole core network. So when you have a simple scenario that really helps you to see the big picture. But I have to say that only works for simple scenarios, and we will see that in the slicing example. Also, what we did is that network functions have a reasonable default configuration, because many people just want to, maybe they do run testing, and they just want to have a core network with a config. So in that case, uh, it just starts and it just works. I mean, that's the approach uh, we are having here. Um, yeah, and if you want to, to change the configuration, if you want to have a more difficult or your own scenarios, the way to go is just to mount the YAML configuration file. And there is only that way, at least uh, what we support. Um, yeah, so that's the motivation. So now we'll talk about the design decisions we took to get here. Uh, first of all, one very essential I wouldn't even call it pattern. It's more a philosophy in software engineering is do not repeat yourself uh, or try. Um, because duplicated code is easy to write and it's hard to maintain. So just writing code is quite fast. You know, uh, you don't need much time. But then when you want to even change a small thing, it requires changes of many lines of code. And also sometimes it's copy paste. So you forget some part here, you change it here, you don't there. So that's the problem with the maintainability here. And in our case, it's even worse because when we have a config change that is relevant to all network functions, we have to change the code in all network functions repositories. So depending which one you're counting, that's more than eight at the moment. So that's a lot of effort for us to, to maintain the code, right? Um, so here's an example from an SMF. I, I won't go through the code in detail this is just from the old configuration so basically what we are doing here is we read the ip address from the smf config from uh for the CSCF, so it's ims config we read it we parse it um we check if there was a mistake and if not that works i mean the code itself is fine right that's good looking code and it's also good code the problem is the line below we have basically the same code and as you can see here there is not much a difference but if you look closely aha uh -huh, we don't have CSCF anymore, we have a DNS IP address, right? And that is duplicated code and that is uh, hard to maintain. So how to solve that? Um, first of all, to solve the problem that we have multiple code pieces in multiple NFs, we decided to make one common source repository. So here we put all the code which is used by more than one network function. For example, configuration is, is really a D key example, I would say. And within, the network function like to solve things like this um there is two main approaches so first of all you could help uh, could use helper functions that's the classical procedural style i would say so you write a procedure or function and you handle it there which is good but because we use c++ uh, we decided to use more more uh, object oriented programming paradigm so oop and i will just explain now how we did that for the configuration so how did we use OOP here. 
basically we created a base class uh, of type config type. And this is merely an interface. So it's kind of an abstract class and therefore it defines pure virtual functions, meaning they are not implemented in this class. Um, yeah, but they just define the interface. And here we have three, we have more, but these are the most important uh, functions from YAML, parse and read the YAML configuration to string, make a nice user output. And which is really new in this uh, whole thing is validate. So validate the user input, tell the user, okay, you, you supplied wrong values. Um, and each configuration type just then inherits from the config type. And it must implement these pure virtual functions. And that's the key concept of dynamic polymorphism in OOP. Okay, so here is just a simple uh, class diagram just to show you how that looks like. So we have the config type here. Again, just the interface doesn't do much. It just defines everything. And then we have, for example, a string config type, a config value. And the string config value, it takes, it stores as a member variable, a string, its value, and also regex. And the regex is used again to validate uh, the specific value. So we can, in the configuration, just validate all the string values just using a regex. So it's pretty simple. And then of course, we have to implement the two string validate and from YAML methods. Um, yeah, and this is a good example because in the beginning when we designed that, I thought, okay, maybe we don't need a string config type because string is there. So why would you do that for a basic type? And the idea is just to encapsulate all these from YAML things and especially the validation to encapsulate that in a separate type for a string, right? Um, and that's why we do that. It's, it's a bit boilerplate. It doesn't do much, but it still needs to be there to, to follow the nice design. Okay, but that's quite boring. It's just a string. Uh, but for example, if we define the local interface, meaning it's the interface where, for example, the SMF reads where uh, it should serve the N4 interface. So where is the PFCP server client located? And that's exactly there. So we define a host, a port, interface name, that's basically it. And you will see in the configuration, I mean, that's kind of one-to-one -one mapping what is written in the config. And then based on that, we generate values, we read the interface, we check what is the IPv4 address, what is the IPv6 address, what is the MTU of that interface and so on. And again, as always, we override the functions, we implement them. And then we have getters, like get host, get port, whatever. Um, just a side note here, getters are normally not, uh, liked in the C++, C++ community, that's more a Java thing. Uh, but here we explicitly used getters because we do not want people to set the configuration. So we don't have a setter and a getter. We only have a getter and the configuration is only set in the constructor or in the from YAML uh, function. So we really want, uh, if people are contributing and they think, okay, I will just change this part here quickly. So that's something that should not happen because it can have consequences, right? And then so on. For example, if you have an SPI interface where we just host the HTTP servers, right? Basically we have all the things from the local interface, we just need an API version. So we add that there. And we inherit from the local interface, meaning all the code and all the values from there, we can just directly use. So that's the basic object oriented um, design architecture of the config. Yeah, this is how it looks like uh, in the code. So this is not the local interface. This is a UE DNS. And I show this example because before we, we've seen how the UE DNS is parsed in the old configuration. And here you see, it's just a string config value. So these are user provided values. And then based on that, we generate the real IP addresses we are going to use in the code. And if you want to read the IPs, or not if you want, I mean, that's there, it's a code. So reading the <laughs> IPs in the code is basically that. So we validate first the user input. We validate if the string is correct. And if the string is correct, we just convert the IP address to the value we are going to use. Okay, and one other key uh, design here we wanted to follow is reusability. So basically the new configuration is really generalized because we want that each NF can use, adapt, and enhance this code in the common source. So everybody uses the code, uh, every NF, uh, but each NF can adapt it to its own needs. 
And that's the point behind it. And that's why the configuration has some aspects even of a library. So there is a high level of abstraction, which makes things a little bit more difficult, but it also allows us to increase the code reuse. So basically we can just reuse parts of this code, but the, what we have to pay for it is to make it a little bit more abstract. And because we do not want to reinvent the wheel, um, we just use the YAML CPP library to read the YAML files. Okay, so just a quick uh, review about the pros and the cons of this approach. So pros, definitely, I mean, that was our main goal is to have reusable code, to have maintainable code, and also code which is easily extendable because we will add new features, which means we will have new configuration parameters which should be supported. Also, we use modern C++, so that's really C++ 17 and onwards. Um, so that's, yeah, modern <laughs> C++. Um, and also, as I've said, YAML is user-friendly and it's the way to go for these kind of configurations. Of course, there are some cons. So if uh, people are very familiar with the C-style procedural programming paradigm, all these, you know, excessively much uh, many classes might be uh, hard to understand because why, yeah. Uh, but that's always the case when you switch from uh, different programming paradigms. So that's not a reason to not use OOP. And you could argue that's over-engineered. It's always the, how to say, it's always a trade-off between making things right and, you know, going too much down the rabbit hole. But I think here we really made a kind of good compromise between really high abstraction and uh, re reusability. All right. Uh, if by any case you want to contribute and you want to extend the configuration, you want to add your own configuration, how to do that. So you can just start with any network function, for example, the SMF, and then you just check the configuration from the SMF. So SMF config, uh, the file which used to be there is still there. Um, and then you can go to the common source repository, which is a sub sub uh, git sub module. So it's in the SMF, so to say. And there you will see the, co the config and the config types. And this is the, let's say, framework for the configuration. And then you don't really have to understand everything because it's written like a framework. You just have to inherit from config type. You just have to implement your functions and you're ready to go. And then you can just hook this, uh, this configuration in, your, in the existing code. And you only have to call the from YAML uh, method there. So that's, that's quite easy to extend it. And that also was the goal of this exercise. Okay, so I will go through the uh, configuration and I will do that inside the IDE. So I will zoom a bit. Please tell me if it's uh, too small. If you cannot see it, please just uh, turn on your microphone and tell me. Otherwise I will just go through that. Okay, nobody complained, so I think that should be <laughs> fine. Okay, so let's start. Um, basically, so what we did, um, we are here in the Federation repository. By the way, I have that in the uh, in the slides just for later if you want to check. Here is the link of this configuration I am now discussing. Actually, it's the wrong link. Anyway, um, so we are here in the Docker Compose of the Federation. A repository in the develop branch. That's really important to know it's the develop branch because it's not in the master branch yet. Um, and here we have our Docker Compose files. I'm sure you know them. And what you see here, the big difference is that we do not have any environment variables anymore. So if this is the SMF, you can see basically we just mount the configuration uh, using the volumes keyword. And we are now you're looking at the basic NRF config. So let's have a look. Uh, let's start with the boring stuff. So log level, that's quite, I would say, self-explaining. Here you can configure the log level. What is cool here, because we designed the, this file to work with all NFs, uh, what you can do here is uh, you can define log level for each NF. So for example, if you want to say, okay, SMF is too spammy, I just want warnings. Actually it's warning, not warn. Uh, you can just define it here. And if you want to say, okay, uh, NRF should be debug, it's debug. And all the other NFs which are not mentioned here, it's just the value from general. Um, 
Mm. And it behaves the same for the register NF feature. So if you if you say here yes, it means this network function which reads this config file will register to the NRF and it will also use the NRF discovery mechanism to um, find other network functions. So yeah, here you can also do that. So you can say SMF should register AMF not NRF. Yeah, NRF doesn't need to. Um, PCF should and so on. But that's a bit tricky because uh, if it is a yes here, uh, for example, SMF expects UPF to also register. So here you have to be a bit careful. Yeah. Okay. And one really cool thing, what we changed in the new configuration is the HTTP version. So before we kind of supported HTTP version one and two in the same deployment but that really led to some issues. So we decided, okay, we will support either or. Um, but the big advantage now is here, you just have to change that value and the whole core network is either HTTP version one or two. And that's it. So you just, we can leave it to one and it's one. You do not have to change any parts. So whatever, it's just like that. So that's a big advantage to before because before that was always a bit tricky. All right, uh, and then, I would say that's the hard piece of the configuration. You configure the network functions, NFs, and here that's just a dictionary of network functions. So you say AMF, okay, we define a host, yeah. Uh, we define an SPI, so where, where we serve HTTP, port, API version, interface name, that's it. And then because AMF also needs an N2 interface, you do the same, right? That's quite straightforward. For example, if you would delete the port, uh, AMF is that AMF would read a default port. So it would just use a default port, which in our case is 80. And you will see that when you run the NF, you will see all the configuration printed values from here and also default values, which the user did not provide. Yeah, and that goes on. We configure SMF, UDM, UDR, AUSF, NRF, and so on. Um, then we have the database. That's quite not straightforward. I mean, that's just configuring how to connect to which database. Yeah, okay. But it's here in the common config because AMF can use it and UDR can use it. So we do not want to repeat even in the configuration file uh, different configs. Uh, yeah, and then we already get to the um, NF specific configuration. So basically here we have two large ones which are AMF and SMF. And here for people who use the core network before, you will find a lot of values again, because we did not change everything. We basically just took the same values. We removed some, but basically you can just understand what's going on here when you understood it before, right? Um, the advantage is here that it's in one file and it makes sense where it belongs. So yeah, so AMF, again, pretty straightforward. You can enable the simple scenario meaning we use the mini version, no UDM, no UDR, AMF does that all for you. Excuse me a second. Um, yeah, and then you can configure the served Guami list uh, where you just put your PLMN and your AMF region ID. And that's, that's, in my opinion, these kind of things are the biggest advantage because before you had like served underscore Guami underscore list MC, underscore MCC zero. Okay, yeah, what's that? Here it's really clear, okay, that belongs to here and you can have a list of that. And the same goes for the PML, PLMN list where you would define the tracking area code and also the NSSI, which are supported by the AMF. Then, yeah, the algorithms which are used for integrity, protection and encryption. And that's it for the AMF. And then for the SMF, it's also quite straightforward. I mean, here we can configure if we want to use UDM uh, subscription info or local subscription info. And here again, we can do the same towards the PCF. Use local PCC rules or PCF, PCC rules. Um, then we have the UPF, UPFs actually. So that's a list of UPFs here. And here you do not really have to configure anything if you use the NRF. So here, this is just an example. But for example, if we go to this configuration, this configuration does not use an NRF. So if you don't use an NRF, you really have to configure the values for the UPF here, for the SMF to be able to create the PFCP association and connect with the UPFs. 
but in case not, you can you could even delete it. You could just delete it and that's it. Um, yeah, and then you have some basic configuration like the DNS configuration for the user, the IMS configuration for the user, and then you have the local subscription info. And what is interesting here again is that here you do not define the DNN data structure. You just say DNN OAI or DNN default. And the actual DNN configuration is here in its own structure or container. Because the reason we did that is the DNN, this configuration is exactly the same also used by the UPF. And the open air interface UPF is not yet using the YAML config, but we are working on that. And soon also the UPF will use that. Meaning if we define this here in SMF, um, we would also need to define it in uh, UPF. So that again has the risk that there is a mistake. So if the user says here, okay, this is uh, whatever network 14.1 in SMF, but then in UPF, he says, okay, it's 12.1, uh, it will just not work. So we will have routing issues or something else. And then uh, the UE will not be able to connect or will not have user plane. And that's just a common, uh, common source of mistakes. And we really want to avoid that, which is why you configure it once and you just use it here. That's uh, the concept. All right, so that was a quick walkthrough to the configuration, um, to the basic configuration. Um, if somebody has questions about that now, uh, you can also ask that if it's just a quick question. Otherwise, I will go to the end. Um, okay, I see there is some stuff in the chat. Um, I will answer that later. Okay, I think that's easier because otherwise we will be stuck here too long. I will reserve more time in the end. Okay, so basically I also promised a demo and it's always good to make a live demo. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong. Um, anyway, so what I'm doing here is I'm just starting the Docker Compose basic NRF. Um, I will revert that file if that's okay for you. Um, actually, I, I, I want to show you before the validation because I talked so much about the validation. Uh, let's say a user um, puts here HTTP version five, yeah, maybe in 30 years, who knows, um, but he puts it now or she, and that's a problem, right? And if you do that now, let's say we start the SMF, start the service oh, up, oh yeah, SMF. Uh, yeah, we start that. Actually, other NFs are also starting, but uh, let's ignore that for now. And we can already see here there's an error. Um, configuration validation not successful because here he tells us, okay, validation of HTTP version not successful. Five does not follow the specification. And we have these validations in, in I, want, I want to say all the places, maybe it's most of the places, maybe it's missing one or two things because it's still in development. But that's basically what we want to do. If the user provides wrong values, we want to inform them. And we do not want even to start. We want the user to know, okay, there is an issue. Let's stop it now. Um, yeah, and that's just the output of the configuration. That's quite similar than before. It's maybe a little more, little bit more clear. But basically here in the beginning of the network function, you really see what is configured. So it should be really obvious how the SMF is behaving. Okay, let me. Make that small again if I find it. <laughs> Come on. Ah, tricky. Uh, anyway, okay. So let's uh, stop that now. And this is just to, to show you that it actually works. So we're starting the core network. All the NFs already use the new uh, configuration, except the UPF. Again, we're working on that. Um, so we wait until it's, uh -huh. you know, uh, did I tell you about that it's always a good idea to make live demos? Because I tried that half an hour before. I know everybody says that, but I really did and it worked. Um, let's see again if that was just a temporary issue. Otherwise, you just have to believe me that the config is working. You still have five as your HTTP version. Ah, 
thanks you so much. <laughs> okay, actually, if I would have uh, looked at the Docker lo logs, I would have seen that SMF is not starting. And actually, uh, yeah, and also NRF is not starting. So obviously, thank you, Rafa. Thank you. Um, okay, now it should work. But at least, you know, we, we've seen, it's a good example we've seen in the beginning, okay, there is a mistake, something is horribly wrong. It's not even starting correctly. Let's have a look. Okay, that looks nice. And I think, uh, yeah, if you want, we can check if the containers are healthy, but yeah, they're all healthy. And we can just start the GNOT sim. We can just make an attach and a PDU session establishment. Yeah, and we see we have an IP address. We can also make a traffic test. And we see we have traffic, we have user plane, uh, the device is connected, right? But I don't want to, to go much longer here because I want to show you the more interesting examples. Yeah. Um, I will now show you how to configure the slicing scenario because this is more difficult, even with the new configuration, because the slicing, Okay, um, that's confusing me. Uh, because the slicing is just difficult to configure. You have many NFs uh, living in different slices. You have three SMFs, you have two NRFs. So these kind of scenarios are just hard to configure. So I will just show you how we did that here. Mm, basically, uh, we have this Docker Compose slicing uh, basic. So. In this example, that there was a quick, uh, I showed that too, too, too quickly, but just to, to tell you, because basically we use one AMF, one NSSF, and also the database, the same, but we have different UPFs, we have different SMFs, and we have different NRFs. And that's basically how the configuration looks like. Because if we go to the file, I mean, I will not have time to, to go through that in detail, but you can really look then uh, at home and try to understand how the configuration works. So for example, if we go to the NSSF, we can see it uses a configuration which is called slicing base config. And also its own slicing config, which is also a YAML file. But the slicing base config is the, the one I'm talking about here. Also UDR using slicing basic config, UDM as well, uh, authentication function as well. But then we have the NRF for the slice one and two, and it uses the file slicing slice one config. So that's a different file, right? And we have the NRF slice three. It uses another config, slice three. And AMF again uses the base config because we have one AMF. And then each SMF has, has its own file. So we see again, slice one, slice two, slice three. And uh, as I've said, the, the UPF is not yet in the new config. Okay, so let's have a look at that. I mean, that really shows how dynamic this new approach is because you can have one file for all the NFs, but basically you can also have um, one file for each NF. It's up to you how you want to configure that and it should work in all the cases. So yeah, this is the common, the slicing base config. So here we have AMF, UDM, UDR, authentication and NSSF, and that's it. We don't have SMF config here. We don't have NRF config here. And we again have AMF stuff, right? And that's it, and NSSF stuff. And then in slice one config, we basically only have SMF and NRF. And in SMF, we have the slicing specific configuration for this SMF. So this SMF only supports this slice, uh, slice, <laughs> slice 128, 128. And that's it. And it also has only one DNN. And this SMF that's now slice two has the slice one, okay, that's confusing. But the slice file two supports the slice one. That's another SMF, right? And another SMS, SMF with another slice. So that's uh, how you configure that. I mean, again, I can just up this to, to show that it's working. And I have to have a look at the time because I see there are quite some questions. Um, Let's just hope it works. It's done. 
yeah, that looks good. We can just make a quick test. Okay, and we see all the devices are working. Um, sorry for being so quick now. That's just uh, here I just started three different devices, three UEs, different UEs, and each has a different slice. So we can test the whole network if everything is working correct. Uh, yeah, and as you can see, uh, we have a user plane for all of them. Okay, so that's the slice stuff. Mm. I will stop it again, also here. Okay. Um, and that's that. So this whole scenario, this quite complicated scenario, we basically configured, I mean, we, we needed four files, but in the end we configured that with really little lines of code. Uh, lines of configuration. So that's really cool. Again, here for your uh, reference later, you have all the files here. Um, I will very quickly show you the uplink classifier scenario, just show you what is the difference, but that's not so interesting yet because the UPF is still the old config. I just want to show you that it's also there. I will not run it now because of the time, but I just want to show you the main difference here. Uh, here in the beginning, it's really the same. The main difference is here that we have we have the PCF, we define the PCF here, and we also tell the SMF to use, sorry, to not use local PCC rules, meaning it he has to get it from the PCF. And here we have three different UPFs configured, and the rest is basically the same. Um, basically the same, basically the same, but here we have a PCF specific configuration. So here we need to configure where the policies are located. Actually, you don't really need that because that's exactly the default values from the PCF, but that's just here for your reference. Okay. Mm. Again, this is the architecture of the uplink classifier scenario. You can have a look at that in, in more details. We have the uh, tutorial for that. Okay. Um, we have the tutorial for that. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. And this is the configuration file of that. Um, now I just want to, before we go to the Q&A, because I think we should have more time for that, just a bit more about the reducing of the duplicated code in the OAI SMF. Um, because current situation, as I've said, is that many network functions use the same code for certain functionalities. So basically, um, we have protocols, PFCP, which are copied, for example, PFCP is an SMF and UPF, which we have HTTP stuff, which is used everywhere. We have utils, which is also used everywhere. And we have common models and definitions and so on. And what we see now is the code, it already began to diverge because we started two years ago, so you change a little bit there and here, and it's really hard to maintain the same code uh, in several repositories. So that's again why we did the common source. And I just want to point out that it's not only for the config, it's for everything. And we use this as a Git submodule. And we are now in the process of migrating copied code. And also during the migration, we are refactoring the code a bit. And we are done for the config and also for the logger. And the logger was really simple. <laughs> But still, um, just here an uh, example. I mean, in the end, this is just the lines of code, lines of actual code without comments we are using here for the config. And we can see in some, we are a bit more. We have like 1,400 lines of code more. But for example, if you look at the NRF, we have only 20 instead of 200, meaning these 180 lines of code were duplicated. Um, yeah, so we, we really saved a lot of duplicated uh, code here. The same is true for PCF and NSSF. In the SMF, it's not true because a lot of code, the SMF has a lot of um, configs and also we are not done with the migration there. So we can still remove some code there. Okay, um, yeah, again, more lines of code, but actually only for four NFs, if we count all the others, we would have a net loss of lines of code, which is good. Um, yeah, we also have the validation. And of course, we also have some overhead through the object-oriented programming paradigm. Yeah. 
but we don't have any code duplications and there is still potential to remove more lines of code. Uh, for you as an information, so the next steps, what we are doing here, we're currently refactoring the HTTP client and we want to use the same HTTP client for all network functions. Again, we put it in the common source and the others just use it like a library. Um, we want to refactor the NRF registration and lookup procedures and want to also to move it there because every NF is using that. And we will also move the PFCP protocol layer to common source because we uh, use it by SNF and UPF. Okay, I will skip the code examples for now. And one important thing uh, to mention here at the end is that it's still under development. So please, if you have time and if you're interested, use it and give us feedback either right now or in the mailing list or in GitHub, GitLab issues, or you can just sign, send me an email, whatever. Uh, but we would really appreciate the feedback of the community because in the end, this uh, uh, action or this or the task was to make it easier for the users, so for you. So please, if you have some feedback, please do not hesitate to contact us. All right, so that's it from my side. I have seen many questions in the chat. So I will just try, I will just read and... Okay. So I have answered a few of them, but you can, think, yeah. you can, you can mm -hmm. confirm my answer if you want to. I mean, it's just... Uh... Mm -hmm. Okay, there was one question about a linting tool. That's a really good idea, I agree. Uh, that's something we can really have a look into. Also make a YAML schema, for example. Um, yes, NH, NG HTTP2 for HTTP2, yeah. Uh, the refactor is for the client. So because uh, Rafael said I'm working on the refactor, the refactor is for the client, for the HTTP server, we still are sticking to NG HTTP2. And for the client, we're using curl. Mm. Um, will the uh, NS take any change on the fly when the config map volume is modified or restart required? That's a really good feature request. Unfortunately, at the time being not. So uh, at the time being, you start the NF, it's reading from the config. And when you change something, you have to restart. That's a bit troublesome. Um, we also have an API to read and change the configuration, but that only works if no UEs are connected. Um, that's a really interesting feature, and I think we will definitely look into that. The problem is it's really complicated. Just imagine if uh, you know you have a PDU session with DNN default, and we change this DNN to default two or to new DNN. What to do with the old session? Do we kick them out? Do we delete it? So there is a lot to think about it, but it's absolutely uh, uh, really worth to think about that. Um, Yeah, the question is, uh, other than looking through the code implementation of the YAML parser, is there a way to know all the configuration keywords and the format value range? Um, as Rafael has said, the logs are really helpful. So you get a dynamic feedback uh, if you made the right configuration. Also the linting tool would help for this. And also I think what we really have to provide here is a documentation like um, maybe not a wiki page, but really have one document where we describe the values. Either we do that directly in the config file, you know, we say allowed values, whatever, or we do it in a separate document, but uh, some kind of documentation is missing for now. And we will provide that. Uh, yes, that's also an advantage. Um, you can use the same values for same file for Docker Compose and Helm, which really makes it easier to, to have uh, both of that. Uh, what do we achieve by having separate NRF plus slice was one question. Um, basically, the, the way this slicing scenario works here is that NR, uh, SMF, because SMF is the one which is being sliced, so to say, so we have multiple uh, SMF here. Mm. SMF will subscribe to the specific NRF for its own slice. 
So in that way, when AMF uh, is getting, because AMF will ask the NSSF, okay, uh, for this slice, uh, please give me the corresponding NRF. And that's how we solve that. So basically, we use this NRF, which is in that slice, in this slice, so that it selects the right SMF. Um, that's that's the reason uh, why we do that. Okay, and there is another question about any reason for not using YAML anchors uh, limitation. That's a good question. For this, I'm sorry. I I I, I would have, need to have a a look into that, to be honest. So here I am. Yeah, maybe if we have time uh, later, we can have a quick discussion. Um, let's skip that for now. Uh, and then there's another question, what other parameters of a slice can be configured apart from the AMBR? What are the other keys under the QS profile? Any documentation on this? Uh, that's a good question. So basically, um, you can configure, the thing is, in SMF, we only support a really basic um, subscription configuration. So um, I'm just searching for, ex for an example with the full config, but I don't think I have that. Again, there is no, the question also was, there is no documentation on that, but we will also provide documentation for all the values, including the QS stuff we have more values here you can configure the 5qi you configure the arp policy so if you should preempt or not um what else can you configure here i think that's basically it um yeah and the qfi of course you can configure the qfi um but that's basically it. So here you cannot uh, configure any more advanced QS stuff like um, non-guaranteed bitrate or whatever. You cannot do that here. Uh, for that, you would need the UDM configurations and the database. Um, yeah, And also later the PCF. But actually we are working on the QS right now because currently this is basically all the QS we are supporting. Um, Okay, so there is another question, but I think Raphael uh, answered that about the. Okay, if there are other tutorials, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's more uh, organizational. Um, Yes, no, the refactoring did not really have an uh, impact on performance. We hope that it will have an impact when we um, refactor the HTTP client and also some code in the SMF. But to be honest, for the config, I mean, it's read once. Uh, so here we are not really um, performance sensitive, I would say. I mean, if, if the startup takes two milliseconds or five or even 200, uh, it's not really a big issue. But yeah, uh, we definitely want to look and we are looking at performance uh, implications when we refactor the code. Yeah, <laughs> I have seen that, that confused me a bit. Uh, yes, you can configure the QS of the slices. As I've said, you can configure it here. If you want to have a more, uh, let's say complex configuration, you can also configure it in the UDR using the database file um is it db2 right uh and here you have the qs profile okay I, i'm i will not find it now but here you can configure it per ue which is the cool thing because uh here you can only configure it per slice and per dnn um okay yeah as rafael has said we will update the helm tutorials Okay, what do we achieve by having separate NRF for slice? I think this question has already been answered. Okay, that's uh, all the questions in the chat. Uh, 
Uh, yes, it is possible to share the slides, I think. That's a question to Camille. Um, we still have five minutes, so if anybody has any further questions, I would be happy to answer them. Stefan, uh, could you please comment the um, roadmap? Um, well, what do you mean by comment? Like, um, uh, you know, give a, give an idea on uh, of about what's on uh, what's next uh, on the on the OAI core network. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what's next in the OAI core network? So first of all. As I've said, we are still in the middle of this refactoring process. So we will move all this stuff to common source to make our life easier and make the code more stable. So that's one um, key um, issue we want to solve. And also what we are going to launch in the next month is we will launch our QS project. So we will basically implement the quality of service end to end within the core network as it should be using the QS from the PCF, and we will also be able to support here multiple QS flows per PU sessions. So, and then at least configuration-wise, you should be able to, for example, configure non-guaranteed bitrate uh, QS things, per slice, per UE, whatever. Yeah. Um, that's basically the rough roadmap. I would need to have a look at the official roadmap, to be honest, to uh, to comment on that. Um, let me have a look. I don't know it by heart. So yeah, the YAML configuration was a big part. Um, yes, and then apart from the big uh, things like refactoring QS, we also want to support um, other things. We also want to integrate unit tests in the in the code, we also want to release the network exposure function at some point, and we also want to support IPv6 in the upcoming uh, quarters, so in 2023. Um, yes, there was one question about the order. You're absolutely right. We are working on reducing that so that each NF can run on its own. It doesn't uh, have to wait. It doesn't depend on other network functions. Okay. Uh, when we change the value of SST, will we have a slice? Um... There's somebody asking a question about the OAI G node B uh, supporting CUDU containerized implementations. Uh, is there anybody here? Rafael Sagar, maybe you guys can answer. Uh, for CUDU containers, yes, we do have uh, tests that are testing CU and DU in separated uh, containers. Uh, and I we are going to be supporting slicing. Uh, I think for not, not that much, I would say, uh, I don't think it supports many slices. I think it's only supporting one slice. I'm not sure about that. I need to check. Uh, sorry, Michael. Uh, uh, I don't think it supports multiple slices, I think. And in fact, yeah. I think it's, they made, I think, uh, in the configuration, the SD parameter quite silent, so I think it's even worse than that, I think, uh, for the moment. So how do we uh, actually test uh, slicing when we do? Uh... We use uh, run emulators that are supporting it. Okay, okay. okay. That was also a question, follow-up question from uh, Mikhail. Hmm. Uh, that's more a question to you, Rafael. Uh, Luis asks, uh, are all these Docker images available or do you recommend to compile from source? Okay, so on Docker Hub, we are publishing uh, images every time we merge into a developed branch. So for example, SMF, we just merge like uh, before, <laughs> before the webinar. Uh, and, uh, 
it was useful for the webinar. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we, every time we are merging into AMF, uh, NF uh, into the develop branch, we are pushing a new image to uh, uh, Docker Hub. So that means that now in the federation repository, you have a master branch and a develop branch because develop image with this YAML support are no longer uh, working with the master branch tutorials. So, so if you are on master, that means that you have to run with a 1.5.1 release that we, I made uh, early June, if I remember well. Uh, and if you want to use the develop image, then you would need to work on the develop uh, branch of uh, uh, of the federation repository. So I, as I mentioned also in the chat, so currently we I only updated the Elm charts for the ones that are using the CI because we are finishing up the uh, new UPF that will replace the obsolete uh, SPQ tiny and we because we are not doing this YAML uh, refactoring on the on this old uh, repository, but on this new function. Uh, so that's why we want to, okay, so if you're on develop branches and on the image, uh, bear with us, it's a working process. And in fact, like uh, Stefan mentioned in the, in the tutorial, in the webinar is that it's also the, this uh, objective of this uh, webinar was to expose this to the community and to have an exchange with you because, uh, okay, that's our thought on how the YAML file shall you or should look like. And but your feedback is very important on that part. Okay. Okay, I think we can answer to one more question and then I think we can close the meeting. Uh, I think Rowan answered it or on the ST stuff. Yeah. And um, there's a last question about the, the slicing. Mm. So Actually, about that, there is the tutorial on the on the Fed repository. Again, use the develop branch, and there you can see how it is uh, configured. And actually, the SST really matters, and also the SD value matters. If that and was the one last question is: uh, Is uh, our five G core compatible with other open source RAN? So SRS RAN, we tested with SRS RAN. Uh, RAN, yes, SRS RAN, for example, we tested. And we also, we, we are in fact testing also with RAN emulators that are cannot uh, uh, other open source RAN, but they are not full RAN stacks. And they are just emulating mainly the NAS and uh, NGAP layers uh, for us to, uh, to have different versions of this. Because uh, if you look at it, uh, a RAN or even the for, we see that on our UE side, and if you have multiple firmware in the UE modems, and that, that uh, you can have different uh, behavior. So the, I think the one that we use, yes, is SRS RAN. We also tested our 5G core with SRS RAN and a, and a cocktail module, if I remember well. Yes. Ah, a Slack channel for the user community. I will post it on the, I think there is one. Yes, uh, it's on our Slack. And it's yes, that's it. It's that copy the copy the name. Can I copy the I, I put that in the I'm sorry, it's called five G core on our open interface Slack. Like, let me see if I can copy. Can I copy the edit edit topic manager? Ah, saga, you as you the yeah. That is one, yeah. It's called 5G core. On our Slack. And, and we have private for, for the developers, but it's, and there is another one that might be interesting for, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's private. Okay. There's a 5G issue also. If you want to report an issue on Slack. All right. That's it. I think that's it. All right. Okay. Thanks.
Thank you, Stefan. I think we are at the end of the webinar. So I'm thanking you all for your attention and interest into this webinar. And I hope to see you in the next uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Fan. Bye-bye. <laughs> What's the link?